Okay, what we'll be looking at now is ocean life, like in the picture behind me as well. And so <clears throat> what I'll do, go ahead and get the PowerPoint up here. Um, I'll be talking about a wide assortment of things. <clears throat> and again, the main point is to get an appreciation for some of the diversity of things in the ocean and some of the major groups. Uh, certainly not expecting you to remember every detail, but hopefully fun learning about these different types of organisms. Okay, what sorts of biological stuff is there in the ocean? As we already noted with seawater, there's a variety of dissolved organic things in the water <clears throat> uh, from decay, uh, chemicals released by living things, uh, the waste, stuff like that. And these can potentially be important food sources for other types of living things. A uh, number of ocean animals are able to absorb these, of course, a major source of nutrients for a variety of bacteria and things like that in the ocean. There's also lots and lots of viruses in the ocean. Uh, that sounds pretty bad. You want to not go swimming in? Well, it's probably safer in the ocean than up in the air because we're in the air as well as a lot of things pretty similar to us. Not as much in the ocean. Most of those viruses attack bacteria. They don't affect us at all. <clears throat> we have also a wide variety of bacteria and archaea, chemically very distinctive in forms, but Similarly, very simple cells living in the ocean. Lots and lots of types of bacteria are there. A lot of them we don't know a whole lot about. Uh, if you want to be a famous bacterium, you've got two main options. One is to grow really well in a petri dish, and so be easy to study in the lab. Uh, two is to make people sick, or things we pay a lot of attention to make them sick, then we try to figure those out. But something that's just out there somewhere in the ocean and isn't obviously having a meat effect on us and not too easy to try to tell what's going on in the lab. And we generally don't know much about those. In fact, there's quite a lot of bacteria, not just in the ocean, but everywhere, where all we know is uh, somebody took the sample and analyzed DNA and Hmm, here's some DNA, doesn't match anything anybody's studied. That's another bacterium out there. <clears throat> bacteria do lots of things. Uh, of course, familiar functions up on land, a number of them are decomposers. Some are able to capture light energy, and photosynthesize, or use simple chemicals for their food. <clears throat> As the bacteria that we <clears throat> are trying to avoid up here, it's also true there are bacteria in the ocean that can make other organisms sick. There's a variety of fungi in the ocean, but again, those are typically tiny. Up here on land, well, we know some fungi because they grow mushrooms <clears throat> as their fruiting body, but ocean ones don't do that. They're all pretty small, inconspicuous things. Very important in decomposing, just as they are up here on land. Uh, also, as is true on land, some fungi do grow on other things that are still alive. We have pathogens, just like, say, something like <clears throat> ringworm is a fungus that will grow on us. And there are fungi that may grow on a fish or other things in the ocean. So all these are very important parts of the food chain, parts of the ecosystems, but pretty small and inconspicuous. Not easy to really notice much unless you're specifically looking for them. We have a very wide range of types of algae in the ocean, partly because algae is kind of a catch-all term. It basically means that it photosynthesizes, but it's not a true plant. This includes the familiar seaweed, as well as tiny things that are drifting around as plankton, or also we do have little tiny one-celled things that will sit down on the mud or sand or whatever part of the seafloor. 
we have a variety of pictures. This is one type of <clears throat> diatom in the ocean, one group of single-celled <clears throat> algae, uh, one of the ones that makes a hard skeleton around itself. We have several types. <clears throat> Here's one euglena, got the chloroplast for capturing light energy and <clears throat> flagellum for swimming around. So a lot of these have some kind of animal-like features as well as some more plant-like. <clears throat> uh, often they can both feed on other things and photosynthesize. <clears throat> Dinoflagellates. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> a variety of types. We already know some of these live inside corals and certain other types of marine creatures as symbionts. A number of the ones in the plankton <clears throat> will produce light. They're bioluminescent. Uh, if you see waves kind of glowing at night on the ocean, it's a good chance that it's due to diaphylagellates in the water there. <clears throat> Most diaphylagellates are able to capture <clears throat> sunlight energy, but also if you know other things, some primarily do one or the other. <clears throat> some diaphylagellates are able to produce toxins, and so they are the main culprits in red tides, for example. Uh, this most commonly happens when we have a high level of nutrients in an area, which is something that people may <clears throat> tend to cause because <clears throat> uh, we dump fertilizers and things that then it washes away <clears throat> down the river instead of doing any good where we dump it, or uh, sewage waste, things like that. And so as these wash down to the ocean, they can lead to the high nutrient levels that lead to lots and lots of diatoms. Or sorry, not diatoms, well, them too, but <clears throat> the diaphylagellates. And in turn, large numbers of the diaphylagellates that produce toxins can lead to <clears throat> problems, um, animals dying, things like that. Uh, even if the animal doesn't die, then it may have the toxins in them. And so if we come along and try <laughs> eating, uh, say, mussels or oysters that ate some of these <clears throat> toxic algae, then we can get sick or even further up the food chain. Uh, Sigatura poisoning is a type of problem with some seafood from tropical settings because the fish ate something that ate something and eventually down at the bottom of the food chain was one of these <clears throat> toxic <clears throat> microalgae. Diatoms, like the diaphylagellates, they tend to like it when there's a lot of nutrients around. Um, <clears throat> diaphylagellates have a relatively tough organic skeleton on the outside. The diatoms actually have basically a glass skeleton. <clears throat> and they have a lot of <clears throat> Fun different patterns and forms. If um, <clears throat> uh, there it goes, the computers slowly come with things. Uh, lots of fun shapes. These would make pretty good UFOs. Brown algae, those are large seaweed type algae rather than the one celled things, and, uh, including the very largest of seaweeds, kelp. Uh, we already mentioned sargassum, that's another brown algae, one that again unusually is able to keep growing when pieces break off from the base. Golden algae, in contrast, are quite tiny, one cell, and not very big cells of that. And they're bigger than your standard bacterium, but for a cell that actually has a nucleus, they are rather on the small side. Uh, these, unlike the diatoms, diaphylagellates, like areas with less nutrients around. And many of the golden algae produce little tiny <clears throat> calcite plates over the cell. 
multiple plates on one tiny cell, each of these plates is very, very tiny. But a hard plate, like the diatoms, like the tough <coughs> organic skeletons of diaplagellates, these will often end up as fossils, and there's quite a wide assortment of different forms there. Uh, the kind of ball is one modern one with all the plates on it, and then the pictures over to the left are some fossils of various types, actually dinosaur age fossils, showing some of the variety there, most of the individual plates. Red algae, like the brown algae, we're back to more seaweed type things, things that grow bigger. Uh, certain types of red algae, coralline algae, make a moderately to pretty strong hard skeleton, remnants of coral, hence the name. And so these can build reefs of their own or be secondary components of reefs dominated by corals or other types of organisms. Uh, red algae also provide some important products used by humans. For example, nori, the wrappers on sushi, are a red algae. Also, we have chemicals such as agar and carrageenan that are derived from red algae. Carrageenan, uh, you may have seen that <clears throat> if you read ingredients on food. Uh, specifically, <clears throat> carrageenan tends to help with <clears throat> keeping <clears throat> stuff mixed together well. And this is especially important. It is a standard ingredient in ice cream <clears throat> helps give you ice cream instead of hunk of frozen milk. <clears throat> helps keep it creamy. Green algae includes both more seaweed style things and some in fresh water. A few red algae also make it into fresh water, not so much but also things that are one cell to a few cells. Uh, Spirogyra up here <coughs> is one that's often a component of pond scum. <coughs> uh, Volvox here has a few cells, but it's still basically microscopic. Uh, Olva here is known as sea lettuce. And I wouldn't really recommend it for a salad. It's more like sea <coughs> uh, soggy wilted lettuce <coughs> in form. There are other other protists that are more animal-like in being heterotrophic, feeding on other things and often moving around somewhat more, although some of the algae single cell move around. <clears throat> Again, some of these are planktonic, some of them are benthic. <clears throat> One significant group uh, dominated by forms of skeletons are the <clears throat> Rhizarians. These tend to have kind of blobby amoeba like cells, but a lot of them produce a wide range of fancy skeletons. Radiolarians here on the right and some foraminifera on the left. Foraminifera, most of them live in the ocean, and most of them produce calcite <coughs> shells, so they end up as well as fossils, as well as being present, living around ocean areas. Um, the picture down to the lower left are some extra big fossil ones. Most of them are barely visible specks without a microscope. Some of them are symbionts, like our corals, things like that. Um, even though they're tiny, there can be lots and lots of them. And the accumulated skeletons of these, plus some of the algae we already looked at, things like that, can build up and be important components of forming rock. <clears throat> um, uh, for example, some of these, not the very biggest ones, but the kind of <clears throat> moderate sized ones there in the hand are 
type that is very abundant in the rocks that were used to build the pyramids in Egypt. And actually, Herodotus, who we mentioned way back as an early traveler and explorer and recording all he knew about the area of the Mediterranean, he noticed these things in the rock uh, and guessed maybe those were some sort of petrified lintels from the Egyptian workers' lunches. No, actually, they were fossil forehands, but I'll understand well that Herodotus didn't know much about those. We do have a few types of plants that actually grow in the ocean. <clears throat> True plants are more complex than algae. <clears throat> they are always multicellular and have the parts more differentiated. Uh, actually, all of our ocean plants are flowering plants, the most <clears throat> complex plants, although most of them don't actually have conspicuous flowers. They do have flowers of some sort. All of the ocean plants attached to the bottom. <clears throat> so they have to be able to grow up at least into places where enough light gets in <clears throat> for them to <clears throat> photosynthesize. And many of them grow in places where they stick out of the water. So we've known salt marsh grasses, uh, mangrove trees as a couple of important groups here. We do have one group of true plants that grows underwater in the ocean, the seagrasses. They are related to, but not too closely to the familiar grass of your lawn, but they look somewhat similar. So that gives a general idea of what they look like. Seagrasses tend to grow rather slowly though. You would not need to mow if you had a lawn of seagrass. Of course, you'd have some other issues as well. <clears throat> And they can be damaged relatively easily. For example, a boat scraping on the bottom can leave a quite lasting hole in a patch of seagrass. As to of the salt marsh grasses and mangroves, seagrass can be a quite an important habitat and resource for other organisms. Things can grow on it <clears throat> or <clears throat> live on it, crawling around some or in between the blades of the seagrass. Uh, some things actually eat it. <clears throat> uh, mantis, for example, do actually eat seagrass and relatives of mantis. Again, like the salt marsh grasses and mangroves, <clears throat> you have more things that will be feeding on the bacteria and fungi that grow on dead bits of seagrass than directly eat the seagrass. And of course, all those other things living among the seagrass, those are possible food items as well. Let's see if this link comes up quicker without being quite so strange behaving. Maybe, maybe not. At any rate, hopefully what this will be giving us is a <clears throat> picture of some seagrasses from Florida in this case. Okay, there algae. Uh, there's algae that are growing on the seagrass there. Uh, there you see there's a large snail, the queen conch, <laughs> crawling in through the seagrass patch. <clears throat> Some little patches of coral surrounded by seagrass. <clears throat> Uh, there's a fish swimming over the seagrass, probably keeping an eye out for these small creatures to possibly munch on. <clears throat> okay. And then so there's lots and lots of other things in the ocean. We'll focus a bit more on the animals. Animals <clears throat> uh, tend to be a little more exciting to watch. A lot of them move around. <clears throat> They're also all big enough to notice more than some of these others. Often they have relatively complex structures. <clears throat> and animals can heterotrophic, so they will be feeding on other organisms in a variety of different ways. 
a lot of types of animals in the ocean are kind of worm-like in various ways. Well, being kind of long and skinny is basically the shape you need if you're moving around through sand or mud. And it comes in handy in other settings, say, squeezing through cracks and a reef and things like that. So we have quite a lot of kind of wormy shaped things. Even the left one here is actually a <clears throat> protist single cell. The rest of these are quite different types of animals, actually, but all of them are long and skinny. These are actually tiny ones that live in the spaces between sand grains. Very major groups among invertebrates. We have a few types of animals that are basically irregular in their form. And then some that are essentially radial. They have basically a top and bottom, but no distinct left, right. It's roughly a circle. Yeah, some are kind of oval, but still there's definitely no front or back in that. But the vast majority of animals, including ourselves, have bilateral symmetry. We have a front, we've got a back, we've got left and right. There they are. <clears throat> and bilateral pattern, that tends to go along with moving around. If we are moving, then our front is what's primarily encountering our environment first. So sticking our sense organs out in front makes a lot of sense. And having a shape that is pretty well suited for moving around. If you're just sitting attached in one place or moving slowly or maybe drifting with the currents, well, who knows what direction things are going to be coming from. A more radial pattern is more common in those settings. One major group of animals, primarily in the ocean, there are some freshwater forms, are the sponges. Sponges can be basically irregular in shape or they can be at least somewhat radial in their form. Sponges basically live attached to one spot. At least some of them can very slowly move. <clears throat> basically the cells individually are kind of creeping along and gradually the whole <clears throat> sponge can move a bit, but it's quite slow. <clears throat> Most sponges are filter feeders. <clears throat> Water flows through and they capture very small things like bacteria, uh, absorbing dissolved organic material, things like that, out of the water. The cnidarians include things like corals, jellyfish, sea anemones. Uh, the cnidarians are characterized by having special structures in certain cells that they can sting, and this works both for capturing their food and defending themselves. They may be polyp shaped like a coral or medusa like a jellyfish in their basic form. Characteristically radial, some of them are oval, so you can call that biradial. A few of them have stings strong enough to be in danger. Uh, for example, the box jellies, <laughs> uh, notoriously present around parts of Australia and <clears throat> other warm water areas nearby. <clears throat> uh, the name box jelly refers to the fact that the bell part is somewhat square. <clears throat> and then at each corner of that square, there are long pinnacles with very powerful, potentially <clears throat> deadly stings to them. Of course, also <clears throat> doesn't help on the safety for people. If you're out in the water and get stung badly, you might go into shock and then <clears throat> you're not conscious to keep yourself from drowning. <clears throat> so even if the sting itself wouldn't be fatal, getting in bad shape while you're out in the water has an additional danger to it. Uh, parts of Australia, they actually put nets out to block the Cuban Medusa to make a beach area safe for swimming. 
Uh, but also the sting <clears throat> is very small scale. It has to actually touch your skin <clears throat> to sting you. So even a very thin separation between you and the sting is enough to protect you. Uh, this means, for example, that both you and the horse are safe if you go riding a horse along the beach and into the water a little bit, as the horse has fur all along its legs and won't get stung. Uh, another <clears throat> approach that's <clears throat> taken sometimes, <clears throat> uh, some beaches in Australia, <clears throat> there's the big burly lifeguard and he's wearing pantyhose <clears throat> because that <clears throat> very thin layer is enough to protect against stings. So just in case <clears throat> you have a box jelly, the lifeguard can get out there without being stung himself. A group that looks somewhat like jellyfish, but it actually is a different phylum, are the cone jellies or kinophores. <clears throat> Instead of stinging, they have sticky cells on their tentacles, and so they are catching food <clears throat> with a glue approach rather than <clears throat> stinging. Echinoderms. This is the group that includes starfish, sand dollars, uh, sea cucumbers, brittle stars, things like that. Uh, as the cartoon suggests, <clears throat> they tend to not be all that lively, relatively slow moving forms. Echinoderms typically have a pattern of five directions of symmetry. Immediately from starfish, but also found in others as well. Uh, the pictures here, <clears throat> some of the less familiar things, there's a heart urchin and <clears throat> five different types of sea cucumbers. <clears throat> and here are a couple of brittle stars, a uh, sea urchin, another sea cucumber in front of the sea urchin. Uh, down here is a stalkless crinoid, a feather star. Looks like it's on a soft coral. Various worms, here's an acorn worm. If that head in is squunched up and says stretch like that, mm, sort of looks kind of like an acorn. <clears throat> uh, this is a colonial or relative of the acorn worms. Sea squirts. There are a number of types. Some of them form colonies with these kind of little star patterns on them. Uh, there are also some that are plankton and squirting. They can actually squirt water and propel themselves around a bit. Uh, now, a sea squirt would not be a great substitute for a super soaker, but yeah, if you have a large one, you <laughs> squeeze a bit, the water will squirt out. It has the two openings there for to go in and out and filter feeding. Here are a couple of the floating ones. Some of them can form quite large masses of <coughs> floating things, <coughs> enough space that a diver can kind of go inside the colony. Another group, the arrow worms, they are quite small, probably a good thing for us. They are quite <clears throat> active predators. Most of them are in the plankton. They'll hang out <laughs> sitting motionless until prey comes close and then <clears throat> quick dart forward and grab bite it. Uh, they would be quite a terror say to tiny baby fish, things of that <clears throat> size range. Like many Things in the plankton, they're largely transparent. Some of them actually have eyes that look through the body <clears throat> to the other side. <clears throat> they have <clears throat> sharp spines that they can grab the prey with. Uh, some of them have bacteria, at least some of them, maybe all of them, have <clears throat> bacteria that secrete a poison that they use in helping to kill the prey. Nematodes, 
aptly known as roundworms. They are very, very abundant in sand and mud from the bottom of the ocean. Uh, for the pictures here, they really had to hunt around to find these ones. Practically every nematode <coughs> looks like the ones to the <coughs> middle of the top left of just this plain round worm. There are also a number of nematodes that are parasitic. Uh, things like hookworm, <coughs> um, <coughs> heartworm, the dogs, those are some parasitic nematodes. The arthropods are the largest phylum, thanks to all the insects up on land. They also represent a significant number of ocean creatures, <clears throat> things like the crabs and shrimp and lobsters. Most of the ocean ones are crustaceans, not insects. There are very, very few insects that have an ocean habitat. Here's one ocean arthropod that's not a crustacean. The horseshoe crab is actually a <clears throat> chelicerate related more to spiders and scorpions than to your standard crab. Uh, we have one species, it's not uncommon, although it's been experiencing some declines along our coast here in the Eastern US. <clears throat> uh, actually, didn't just recently graduated from Gardner Webb, did some research on them with a summer project. Um, horseshoe crabs have a component in their blood that is very sensitive to any sort of toxin, it clots readily, and so it's used very extensively as a test to make sure that <clears throat> medical equipment and <clears throat> drugs are clean and safe to use. But of course, taking lots of blood from horseshoe crabs isn't the greatest news for horseshoe crabs. So trying to figure out a way to <coughs> have the <coughs> sensitive chemical to detect any problems while not being a problem for horseshoe crabs is an important goal. That's part of what the student was working on. Here are a few different types of crabs. We have a hermit crab in the shell and then out of the shell. Hermit crabs will use shells from snails. If the snail's dead or if the snail's alive, the hermit crab gets whole, we can eat the snail then move in. <clears throat> and then it will crawl around. It has a soft back end because it's protected inside the shell. Ghost crabs, as we mentioned before, <clears throat> will <laughs> run around on the beach at night, and being very pale, that's where they get the ghost name. Now this is a deep sea chemosymbiotic shrimp, or actually a whole bunch of them. At the hot vent, some of the ones along the mid-Atlantic ridge. You can see they're very abundant there. Uh, scientists collecting these <clears throat> uh, brought some back to the lab and decided to <clears throat> make an experiment uh, given what some shell water and larger shrimp are like. They tried taking one of these and they boiled it in a beaker of water over a Bunsen burner and then tried eating it and it was awful, which is perhaps not surprising given that they're feeding on <coughs> bacteria that are <coughs> using sulfur compounds as an energy source. Sulfur, again, we mentioned hydrogen sulfide as being in the anoxic deep water of the Black Sea and also being the smell of rotten eggs. Uh, sulfur is a component of things like garlic and onion smells and a lot of really nasty smelling stuff is rich in sulfur. So lots of sulfur and tastes bad not real surprising. These are mantis shrimp. <clears throat> um, as the one at the top shows, 
Many of them have <clears throat> limbs that are similar to those of a praying mantis for the same reason. Those are for grabbing and stabbing prey and able to move very quickly. Uh, some, <clears throat> instead of a stabbing approach, have a more massive club-like <clears throat> into that limb. And they use that for smashing, say, things like clams or <clears throat> crabs or other potential prey. Uh, that's not the best type to keep in your saltwater aquarium either. It can potentially crack the glass. Those actually use muscle <coughs> strength to build up tension, kind of like stretching rubber band, and then snap all at once to smash. And <coughs> that turns out to be some of the fastest movement of any animal. Barticles are a very different looking type of crustacean. <clears throat> but inside that outer skeleton of the barnacle is a little shrimp-like feature. A baby barnacle looks not that different from some other types of little crustaceans. But when it's ready to grow up, it finds a suitable spot, whatever that particular type of barnacle likes. And then glues itself down by its head and <clears throat> spends the rest of its life kicking its feet up in the water to capture food. There are also some rather bizarre parasitic barnacles. Some of them don't look much like animals, much less <clears throat> like any sort of arthropod. The flatworms are another large group of worms. And there are some fairly colorful free-living ones. Most of them are in the ocean, although this one on the top <coughs> left is a land-dwelling one. Also, like the roundworms, there are quite a few parasitic <coughs> flatworms. And there are lots of little tiny, obscure, plain-looking flatworms. Uh, parasites include things like the tapeworms, uh, the flukes, There's quite a large group of the <clears throat> trematode fluke type things that are external parasites on fish. They'll attach to the outside of fish and then <clears throat> basically <clears throat> um, digest some tissue, suck fluids out of it. <clears throat> and pretty much every type of fish has its own types of parasites. So there are a lot of these out there. There are lots of little tiny obscure groups out there. I'm not mentioning a lot of them, but just for one example, the cycleophorans are, as far as we know so far, a rather small group of animals. They were discovered in 1995, not that long ago. Uh, who is looking at lobster lips? Well, <clears throat> don't remember the name, but. <clears throat> I found something there. Uh, doesn't seem to really matter to the lobster, but because the lobsters do shed their exoskeleton from time to time, like <clears throat> growing insects do, the little thing living on it has to have a life cycle that allows it to swap around and get to the new one when the old one has molted. So it's got a kind of complicated life cycle. Uh, different types of lobsters have different ones on them. Uh, they're teeny tiny things shaped kind of like this. And now you're pretty much an expert on cycliforms. Ribbon worms. And these are relatively flat worms, as the name suggests. <clears throat> Most of them live in the ocean. A few are freshwater or land. <clears throat> and they are typically predators. They're able to very rapidly shoot out a proboscis and use that for grabbing their prey. Some of them have a spine, sometimes with poison, <coughs> to help in capturing prey. The very longest worm known is a type of ribbon worm, sometimes called the bootlace worm. 
the Linnaeus longissimus, appropriate scientific name there. Uh, <clears throat> well, they're kind of stretchy, so that makes it tricky to measure exactly. But <clears throat> uh, some of these can be more than 100 feet long, very, very long worms. They're probably skinny things, but <clears throat> in terms of length, some of the very biggest animals. A very large group of worms are the annelids. Uh, these are, are polychaetes, one big group of annelids. The vast majority of polychaetes live in the ocean, uh, but also there are other annelids. The earthworms are a different group of annelids that, of course, are living <clears throat> in the dirt and also freshwater settings. Wide range, some of these permanently live in tubes. Some of them make hard tubes. You can actually build a kind of reef like over here to the right. Others are active crawlers. <clears throat> uh, some of them <clears throat> live in tubes down in the mud, more or less permanently. <clears throat> Another group, the brachiopods. We briefly mentioned them before, clam-like shell. But the animal is rather different from a clam. Uh, there are lots and lots of fossil brachiopods, not as many living forms. They basically just sit in one place, filter feed. A uh, few of them can do a bit of digging a burrow as well, like the B one here and sees a diagram version of that one. Bryozoans, the name means moss animal. Appropriate enough, some of the bryozoans look rather like seaweed. Uh, others make a somewhat harder skeleton, uh, often patches of stuff that you see perhaps on a shell or other hard surface may be a bryozoan. In close up to tail, they may have a wide range of forms. The biggest group of animals in the ocean actually are the mollusks in terms of a number of kinds. A very diverse group. Um, of course, they're the ones I studied, so obviously they're highly interesting. <coughs> uh, here's an example, pictures of a couple of snails drawn by M.C. Escher, who may not have realized that <coughs> uh, snails come characteristically going one way and not the other, so these are actually backwards. Of course, he made these by printing, so the <clears throat> picture here would be reversed on how he carved it, but he may not have realized that carving the other way would make a more accurate picture of the snail. Moss are important to people in a wide range of <clears throat> ways. We have <clears throat> extensive use for seafood, uh, scallops, mussels, many others. Uh, they inspire a wide range of art. <clears throat> uh, this picture is commonly referred to as birth of Venus, but Venus is an entirely different type of clam. That is definitely a pectin, not a Venus. Uh, this isn't exactly Botticelli's version, as you probably noticed. <clears throat> Seashells are popular for collecting. <clears throat> um, have couple of websites here that offer quite an assortment of shells for sale. Uh, here are a couple of examples. The one up here at the top right, uh, you could have gotten that back when I found the ad here for a little over $3,000. And the one down here was a little over 8000 I did not buy either one. Uh, why the price like that? Well, both of these are relatively big, fancy looking ones in deep water. So very, very hard to get a hold of and kind of popular groups. And that's why we have the prices like that. And as demonstrated here, obviously it's inherently fascinating. Although this one's a freshwater 
<laughs> muscle. There we have the marine snail. After the arthropods, it's the second largest phylum in animals, estimated to have on the order of 100,000 species living today. Most of them make some sort of hard shell, although there are a number that don't have that, like octopus, say, or slugs. A few of the major groups, we have the chitons or coat of mail shells. The name polyplacophore means mini plate bearing, which is appropriate. And they characteristically have a series of eight plates for all the living ones. There are a few fossils that are different. Uh, these characteristically are crawling around on rocks and other hard surfaces, grazing on algae, sometimes on, <clears throat> well, you have things like bryozoans and some types of cnidarians and other animals that, well, they're just sitting there like algae do, and so <clears throat> crawling grazers often feed on those as well. There's also one group of the chitons that is a little bit more active in getting other animals to eat. Uh, but yeah, as you can guess, it's not a real fast mover. But what it does is that it sits on a rock with the front part lifted up like that. And if some small thing crawls underneath, down it goes on top of it and eats it. The snails, by far the largest group of the mollusks. <clears throat> uh, here we have a few different types from a beach up, in this case, in Canada. A wide range of familiar seashells belong to this group, uh, such as the cone snails that we had the video back with the feeding approaches. <clears throat> and here we go. So here are pictures of a number of different types of cone snails. <clears throat> uh, you can see colorful forms, <clears throat> relatively <clears throat> popular for collections. There's also a wide range of <coughs> snails that have reduced or entirely lost the shell, a diverse assortment of sea slugs, <coughs> as well as, of course, land slugs, and very few, but some in fresh water. Many of these are quite colorful. Um, now, of course, often they're living on <coughs> corals or other relatively colorful things. <coughs> But also, these are often warning colors. A lot of them will be taking up <clears throat> poisons from their prey. Some of them, like this one over here, <clears throat> can actually save the stinging structures from eating a cnidarian and use that to defend themselves. There are also even some that can save chloroplasts out of algae that they're eating, and then use that for photosynthesis. So there's quite a <coughs> diversity of different <coughs> types around. One reason why there are so many types of snails is that you can find a snail that eats practically anything. <clears throat> now, most individual types are more specific, but you have some snails that are predators, some that are scavengers, some that are grazing, <clears throat> many that are quite specialized in what they feed on, others more general, quite the assortment. Second to the snails are the clams and the diversity. 
Most clams are relatively inactive filter feeders. <clears throat> uh, they <clears throat> pump water in and the gills not only pick up oxygen for their breathing, but also trap little tiny algae, other things out of the water. And then that's what it feeds on. There are some deposit feeders picking up whatever tasty bits of things they can find <coughs> in the sand and mud around them. Uh, the <coughs> one on the left here is an example of that group. Well, there's multiple groups that do that. Um, also, there's some that are photosymbiotic or chemosymbiotic. The clam on the right here is a chemosymbiotic clam. Uh, it has a very reduced digestive system because it's got plenty of bacteria in it that use simple chemicals to produce their food and also the clam is able to get additional ones from there. Uh, behind me in the picture is a giant clam, which is The cephalopods are a very diverse group. They're not as many types as the clams or the snails, including octopus, squid, and all those things of that sort. A lot of them have quite extensive ability to change their colors. <coughs> they have <coughs> pigmented dots all over them, but they're able to contract or relax muscles around those dots in order to make them more or less visible and can very rapidly change their color. Uh, also, their skin is quite flexible and so they're able to adjust their shape in many ways. The cephalopods are typically active carnivores. So they have to be able to <laughs> outwit their prey and they are the most intelligent of invertebrates. Uh, for example, some octopus in the lab were taught to pick which one of these is different. Now, by human standards, it sounds pretty basic. I mean, it's on Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. Uh, but for an invertebrate to be able to recognize that's a pretty abstract concept. It's not just the square one or pick the green one. It's which of these is distinct from the others. Octopus also are quite notorious for their abilities to escape from a tank. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> why sort of abilities there? Uh, they can recognize and identify a range of patterns. Uh, some degree of play has been observed in octopus and aquarium. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> or recognizing a specific pattern. Uh, one aquarium, <clears throat> one of the night cleaning staff <clears throat> was not happy with an octopus because it seemed like every time <clears throat> it got close to the tank going around, the octopus would squirt water. <clears throat> Well, yes, the octopus did not like them because this was a person who would always come around and <coughs> be turning on the lights, shining at, <coughs> shining a flashlight around at night. <coughs> and so the octopus did not like this and would squirt <coughs> at it. Uh, the link here, again, video doesn't do so great <coughs> with Zoom. So I'll let you click on it and probably try to show it <coughs> later with the class, uh, but it's <clears throat> a bit on the <clears throat> Indian, sorry, Indonesian mimic octopus. <clears throat> <clears throat> and it was only discovered relatively recently, but <clears throat> most octopus, generally their camouflage is trying to match things in the background. The mimic octopus, on the other hand, uh, tends to live in relatively open bare areas where there's not too much background to blend with. And instead, it, by adjusting its shape and color pattern, mimics a variety of other animals. 
and uses that as a defense. Uh, here are examples. We've got a kind of weird looking deep sea squid to the right, a uh, relatively standard octopus in the bottom left. On the top left is a rather unusual octopus, <coughs> the female squid deal larger than the male, and she makes this shell to hold her eggs. <coughs> and so this is actually an egg case, not a standard shell like that of other <coughs> mollusks. Okay, so that's probably a good spot to stop. And next video, we will focus in on the vertebrates, relatively familiar, but there's a good diversity of things in the ocean. So let's end things there. And then get back. <clears throat> there we go, now Zoom's letting yeah. us in the session. Mm -hmm.